Hello, my friends, and welcome to another episode of Connections Between Old and New, a podcast where I talk about connections between myths and old stories with everyday things in the modern day. Today's podcast is going to be geared towards the link between ancient Greek myths and psychological illnesses and how that is possible in affecting research in the field of psychology. However, I will be only discussing illnesses that are apparent in the Western world, more specifically the United States. For those of you who don't know me, I am Sofia Hernandez, and I'm currently a freshman attending Florida State University. My major is psychology, and as you heard before in this podcast, I will be zoning in on the psychological illnesses, along with any medical decrees and their possible connection to Greek myths. Before I dive in, I'm going to ask you to sit down and maybe brew a cup of coffee and just enjoy my small podcast about Greek mythology and its ties to psychological issues widely known in modern times. To narrow down my focus in this podcast, I will be referring to and trying to answer the question of how are links between ancient Greek mythology and Western psychological illnesses affecting research in the field of psychology? Along with the central question I just discussed, I will also be answering the other questions to further emphasize my topic and how each myth affected the field of psychology in a certain way. However, in order to introduce Greek mythology and their connections on mental illnesses, I will have to define some terms that I will be using quite often in this podcast. First, I will be defining psychological illnesses. According to the American Psychiatric Publishing and their, quote, Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders, DSM-5, end quote, psychological illnesses can be defined as a behavioral pattern that causes significant distress, which can be diagnosed in a specific mental illness. A category of these illnesses includes dissociative disorders and how they are defined. They are defined according to Gale Encyclopedia of Children's Health, Infancy Through Adolescence as, quote, a group of mental disorders that affect consciousness, causing significant interference with the patient's general functioning, end quote, including social interactions in everyday life. Try to remember these terms because I will be revisiting them once I start to discuss ancient myths and how some of these myths correlate to modern-day mental illnesses, which includes dissociative disorders and different types of archetypes and mentalities. Since I will be focused on mostly the Western Hemisphere of the world, I will discuss psychiatry and Western culture. You see, psychiatry and Western cul- and the Western Hemisphere and culture has been seen to have been widely influenced by Greek myths and modern prejudices. This can be seen in Fornero's et al.'s article titled, quote, Medicine and Psychiatry in Western Culture, Ancient Greek Myths and Modern Prejudices, end quote. In a couple seconds, I will be discussing this connection more deeply, specifically how ancient cultures contributed to the modern knowledge of medicine and origins of psychiatry, like symptoms and diagnoses of mental illnesses. Before I begin, I'm going to also try to answer the question, quote, why exactly did the authors of Greek mythology even write the myths that they did, end quote. The answer to this can be seen within the article when the authors, Fornero et al., explain how mythology was widely based on real-life experiences. The authors of Greek mythology would base widely their stories on things they could not biologically explain at the time. Therefore, these stories were mutually constitutive stories, meaning that they were based on both real cases and mythological fi- figures slash powers, and would make connections between the two. In the end, this would mean that the stories would tell myths while also explaining the lifestyles and choices done by those in the story. These cures, with further research, were explained to be psychotherapeutic processes that psychologists and psychiatrists adapted into their everyday practices. Some of these therapy methods were explained in Nash et al.'s article, quote, long-term sequel of childhood sexual abuse, perceived family environment, psychopathology, and dissociation, end quote, and how a person's environment when they are a child can determine whether or not they will be majorly affected by certain types of psychotherapy, like hypnosis. There's a distinct link between the modern-day use of psychotherapy in the Western Hemisphere, and it's also being found in Greek mythology.
This can be seen in Tzerberakos and Jezinzi's article, quote, Sacred Psychiatry in Ancient Greece, end quote, where they discuss three different approaches that professionals interpret as, quote, psychic phenomena, end quote, and how everything happens for a reason. They make sure to emphasize at the beginning of their article that each idea that was presented in their article was cross-checked and made sure to have been based on real-life events. Explaining it by saying that those in ancient Greece had a comprehension about every feeling and symptom felt by humankind and how they were very keen to relating it back to a de deity. Due to me briefly discussing, quote, psychic phenomena, end quote, and different mentalities among patients who undergo psychiatric therapy, I'm going to, f to further define archetypes and provide a few examples. This will help you all understand my next segment with a special guest. Now, according to Kendra Cherry, she discusses archetypes and how the psychologist who developed the theory on archetypes went about describing those mentalities. She explains that there are, quote, four major Jungian archetypes, end quote, and how he, quote, believed that the human psyche was composed of three components, end quote, which were, quote, model of people, behaviors, or personalities, end quote. This was all written and quoted by Kendra Cherry in the article, quote, the four major Jungian archetypes, end quote. Cherry goes on to this topic even deeper in another one of her articles titled, quote, the Oedipal Complex, one of Freud's most controversial ideas, end quote, where she lays out the simplistic definition of the Oedipal Complex and how it was developed by Sigmund Freud, a very popular psychologist, due to his theory of psychosexual stages of development. Cherry goes on to discuss how Freud describes the Oedipal Complex in his theory that when a child is developing, they tend to feel emotions or behaviors of, quote, desire, end quote, towards their opposite sex parent and negative neurotic feelings towards their same sex parent. Another author that goes into tremendous depth about the Oedipal Complex is Hans Lowald, who wrote, quote, The Waning of the Oedipal Complex, end quote. And they do a very good job at explaining the, quote, Oedipal Complex, end quote, and how it is being described in the modern day terms and what psychologists would diagnose the patient if they were displaying the Oedipal archetype. Lowald was sure to mention that this is an analyzation of Freud's theories of psychosexuality and psychoanalytic views. However, the author's purpose with this article was to establish the, quote, decline of the psychoanalytic interest in the Oedipal phase and the Oedipal conflicts, end quote. And that was in Lowald's article, page 240, how there is no actual destruction of the Oedipus complex. Therefore, the author is sure to explain that with many studies done by psychologists, the only results that they were able to find is that whenever someone suffers through the Oedipal complex slash mentality, it never really goes away and that the patient has to live with that for the rest of their lives. This is a connection and explanation between having the Oedipal complex and suffering an immense ego and going through with the incest. And this is only really common in the Western Hemisphere. We can better understand these different archetypes and the way it affects people by looking at a case and interviewing people who have experienced this actual mental disorder described in Greek mythology. Today, we will be having a guest by the name of Pamela Tate. Now, she will be retelling her experience as a child and how she exemplified the archetype of Demeter and Persephone. However, she will only be describing her feelings while she had this mentality. This is going to be our last segment of the day before I conclude with my findings through my rigorous research and discussion with you all in today's episode. However, before I begin to explain Pamela and her experience with the maiden archetype, I am going to say a short disclosure for copyright and plagiarism reasons. The person speaking for Pamela Tate is not actually Pamela Tate but will be me retelling Pamela Tate's encounters and experiences as she wrote in her article, quote, the core, my experiences with the maiden archetype, end quote. And she will be directly quoted. Everything that is being told by, quote, Pamela Tate, end quote, will be read directly from her article and re-encounter written directly by her. Please remember that the person speaking for Pamela Tate is not the real Pamela Tate. Along with, quote, my guest, end quote, Whenever I refer to Pamela Tate or her article, 
I will refer to her directly before speaking so that there will be no confusion with having to listen to my voice retell her story. Thank you for listening to this short disclaimer, and now I will get back to my podcast. Now I'm going to introduce Pamela Tate, who is the author of a personal essay, or you could say descriptive article, of her own experiences as a child and now into adulthood with the, quote, made an archetype, end quote, or also known as the Demeter Persephone mentality. Your article, quote, the core, my experiences with the maiden archetype, end quote, was very specific with everything you went through, and that must have been very heavy to retell. Would you mind telling us a little bit about it yourself? Now Pamela Tate will be speaking. Not at all. Like I wrote in my article, I never really noticed me becoming a core until I started running down that field at 13 years old. I had no reason to. I just wanted to get my blood pumping and just have some sort of connections with my feelings inside of me. I couldn't explain, but it just felt like I wanted to be set free. Back to Sophia. Now, when you say, quote, set free, end quote, do you mean that there was something inside of you trying to claw itself out? Pamela. Yes, I had always felt connected to Greek mythology. And when I turned 17 to pursue my dancing career in New York City, that is when I really felt it. I felt as if I was the maiden in odds of despair in the clutches of Hades. But my psychologist says it was just me describing my depression, but it never felt that way. It's just so hard to explain, but I wish I had to more, more time to really explain it all for you, but this is what I can do now. Sophia, I totally understand. That is what you wrote in your article. Could you just explain to me one more time for my viewers to understand a little bit better? Pamela, of course, I will try. Quote, My experience with the core was that without knowing that the mother is searching, grieving, and adamantly raging over the loss of her daughter, end quote, so she felt as if she had to swallow those brightly colored seeds from the fruit of pomegranate to kill herself and her daughter Persephone so she wouldn't fall into the clutches of Hades. But really, I didn't do that, and instead I got a black kitten who taught me that it's okay to give in to temptation and desire and not hold myself back like I did when I suffered through my Demeter Persephone mentality. Her name is Cor, and while I had these feelings, I never gave in to them, but it still plagued my mind like it was the only thing I had going on in my life. Sophia, wow, what a beautiful story. Thank you so much for sharing, Pamela, and have a great day. Due to running out of time in my segment, I will be now moving on to my conclusion of this podcast. I will do this by explaining that many psychologists have benefited by using the links between Greek mythology and Western psychology. However, while they used these connections, there were some cases where they could not find an answer to the issues they were trying to resolve, like incest and the Oedipal complex. Another archetype psychologists briefly discussed would be the terrible mother complex, which was described in Christopher Valisipoulos article, quote, through a glass darkly, Medea as a reluctant goddess, end quote. And has psychologists used this to discuss male anxiety and their fear towards powerful and dominant women? While discussing that briefly, it leads me to my conclusion that when psychologists use Greek mythology with their research, it helps them directly with finding new types of therapy and finding whether or not they can prevent a patient from developing a vile mentality that they may have to suffer through the rest of their lives like the Oedipal Complex. Thank you for listening to my podcast, and I hope you enjoy. Have a great day. Goodbye.